This is a workshop called uh, Total Protection Solutions. It's being presented specifically uh, from the point of view of the planning work that we do for our clients who are farmers or who are farmland owners. This uh, presentation is one that uh, I did originally back in December of 2014 in Brinkley. It was a joint presentation with myself and Robert Serio and Grant Ballard. Robert presented uh, on some issues relating to the, to the new farm bill. Grant talked about uh, crop insurance, but, and um, I presented uh, this presentation, this workshop, and after the presentation, I had a number of people come up to me and tell me that they really enjoyed it, and uh, they told me that they wished that, that they had had family members who had been present for it, and so we decided to uh, re-record it. Actually, Robert Serio and I also gave this same presentation in uh, January of 2015 to a group in uh, South Sioux City, Nebraska on a day when it was, as I recall, five degrees outside. So uh, I wanted to spend a few minutes just uh, giving you the benefit of that workshop uh, and having it here where we can put it on our website and make it available to anybody that wants to to uh, take a look. We call it Total Protection for the Family Farm. This is my part of the presentation. And my objective was to outline six steps that I thought were really important for farm families to uh, protect what they have and be able to leave it to their family for generations so that it's protected not only for themselves but also for the people they care about for generations to come. The first step I want to, this is always step number one in any planning that we do, is let's plan to get the court system out of your business. And what do I mean by that? I mean that, it, that if you become incapacitated, I would like for nobody to have to go to court and have a guardian appointed for you. I'd like for you to choose who steps in and manages all those decisions and to be able to do that at a moment's notice without the need to go hire lawyers and go to court. When you die, I'd like to have you keep the, the probate court out of your business so that the assets that you own don't have to go through the probate court. So I would also like to have you create the legal documents that give clear authority to people that you trust and care about to make health care decisions for you if you're not competent to make those decisions for yourself. Quite often what we found is that is that the people that you choose to manage your property, to manage your business affairs, are not necessarily the same people that you're going to choose to make your health care decisions for you. But the point is that, that you need to be the one who makes those decisions, and you don't need to leave it to the judgment of a, of a judge in a court somewhere to make those decisions. And in my opinion, the best way to do all of that is by creating a revocable living trust estate plan that includes all the documents that accomplish all of these things that I'm talking about here. Okay, step number two. I believe that in your plan, you should provide real and permanent protection to your spouse and to your heirs. And what do I mean by that? I mean, if something happens to a husband or a wife, there is a chance, and it, this actually happens with some frequency, the surviving spouse finds an occasion to get married again. And so one of the things we want to do, I think, if we think about it, is to provide protection for that spouse so that if that marriage doesn't work, the assets that my, that my spouse inherited from me aren't lost in a divorce if the marriage doesn't work, or maybe the marriage does work, but this other person uh, is not necessarily a good influence and ends up taking control of or, in, or ends up becoming the heir to those assets if my spouse dies rather than my children. This is a problem that a lot of my clients bring up with me and I find that in probably half of the plans that we create for married couples we spend a lot of time talking about this in developing specific solutions. It's not an issue for everybody but it's an issue for a lot of our clients and it's an issue that I've found isn't really talked about very much by husbands and wives. It's an uncomfortable subject and I feel like it's really kind of my job to to bring this subject up and get it on the table so that we can deal with it and plan for it. 
So that's an issue. Another issue is planning to protect children from divorces, lawsuits, from their youth and immaturity, and if they have special needs, to also provide a, 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 in the plan uh, a way that that, that that special needs child is protected. You know, the issue of divorce is fairly common. I think about half of all marriages here in Arkansas end in divorce, and we never know for sure over the long term how a relationship is going to play out. And so to me, I think it's worth providing this kind of divorce protection in all the plans that we, that we create for heirs. It's also very beneficial to structure an inheritance for our children so that the assets can't be lost if they get sued and there's a judgment obtained against them. Uh, and we do that by using a testamentary trust that's incorporated into your living trust. We also think it's important to provide uh, very specific instructions for heirloom property so that we eliminate family arguments. You know, one of the things I, I believe is that most of my clients tell me at, at the end of the day what's most important to them is that, there, is that when they die, they want their children to continue to have a relationship, to continue to get along, continue to show up at each other's house for Christmas dinner. And one of the best ways to make sure it works out that way is to not have arguments over tangible personal property. And, and sometimes I've seen it happen that property that has practically no economic value becomes a huge source of, of stress in a family relationship because there was no clarity in, in who was supposed to inherit that property. We can solve all that up front just by doing a little bit of work and thinking about it. All that can be incorporated easily into your living trust estate plan. Step number three is uh, avoid the estate tax. Now I want to spend a few minutes talking about this because a lot of the people watching this video are going to discover in a minute that the estate tax is not even an issue for them. There's another issue there I want to talk about. So let's just talk about the estate tax for a second. Uncle Sam tells us that, that the right to pass property at death is a taxable event. And the courts have the courts have validated that. Actually, the estate tax was last instituted in 1916 to help pay for World War I, and it's never been taken off the books since then. It's, it's bounced around. The rules have changed substantially from year to year. Uh, the last change was made about two years ago on, on, uh, in the early morning hours of January the 1st of 2013. And what happened there is the, the exemption the, that is the amount of money that, or, or the amount of money or property or economic value that we have the right to pass free of the estate tax was increased and permanently increased to five million dollars and that number was actually inflation, inflation adjusted so that here in 2015 that number is actually five million four hundred and thirty thousand dollars and that and that that's what we call the exemption amount and that amount is actually the amount that one person is is uh, is allowed to pass to individual beneficiaries, but if the, if we're talking about a married couple and we're looking at assets that a married couple has together, what you see is that that's almost eleven million dollars that a married couple can leave their children free of the estate tax. The other thing that we've learned is that exemption is now portable, and I want to talk about that for a minute because for about twenty five years I went around the state of Arkansas doing presentations, doing workshops to groups where I, where I made the point that, that, that you had to plan for the use of your exemption in order to avoid losing it. And what we would do is we would ask clients, and I, it wasn't just me that did this, everybody in the estate planning practice area knew that in order to avoid wasting an exemption when the first of the two spouses died was uh, to create what we called an A-B trust arrangement. And what that meant is that the first spouse who died had to create a separate trust for the surviving spouse and transfer his assets into that trust so that his exemption was not wasted. And, and, and so you understand, understand that, that if a husband and wife own property jointly and the husband died, all the property passed to the wife, the way the law worked up until up, up until this last law change is that, is that when the property passed to the surviving spouse, 
the exemption just went up in smoke. It was lost. And that meant that when the surviving spouse died, there was only one exemption. So in order to avoid that, in order to avoid that, we created this bypass trust, or sometimes a trust that we call, at least here in our shop, we call it a family trust. And we had to actually transfer assets into that trust in order to avoid wasting that exemption. But the world is turned upside down now. And whenever the law changed back on January 1st of 2013, what we learned is that that exemption is now portable. And that means that if the husband dies and leaves everything to his wife, the exemption can follow those assets so that, that the wife can inherit the exemption in the same way that she inherited the assets. Now, it is true that you have to file an estate tax return and check some boxes to document that, but it's not complicated and it's not difficult and it doesn't mean you have to pay any estate tax. There is some paperwork to make sure it's port make sure that you've captured the benefits of portability, but you don't have to set up that bypass trust anymore. Now, if it happens that that uh, an individual actually has more than the exemption amount, or if I have a married couple, and that married couple has more than the combined value of two exemptions, or that almost $11 million, if their, asset, if their estate is larger than that, then there is a 40% tax on the excess amount. So if you have a larger estate, you can do the math on that fairly quickly and realize that, that the estate tax can, can be very confiscatory. And so we do have to think about that and plan for that. I'm going to speak of that in just a second. Uh, also want to mention that the, there, there's something that many of you are familiar with, and it's called the annual gift tax exclusion. Uh, that's, uh, that's the amount of money that, that you can give to somebody, and the IRS says, you don't need to worry about that. You don't need to keep up with that. It's too small an amount to worry about. Um, that number is, is still $14,000 this year. Uh, that number is also inflation adjusted, but in order for the number to be adjusted, it has to in, inflation has to drive it up by enough to increase it by at least a thousand dollars. So in years when we have low inflation, you may go two or three years before you actually see that number change. Uh, years ago, when I first got in practice, that that uh, annual gift tax exclusion amount was three thousand dollars, and then. It was increased to $10,000, and then it's increased over the last several years because of this inflation adjustment so that in 2015, that number is $14,000. And that is an amount that, that you are free to give to each year, each year, to as many people in the world as you care enough to give $14,000 to. So uh, it's not just family members. If you were feeling really generous one day and you were sitting in church one Sunday, you could write a check for $14,000 to everybody in the congregation and still have your entire exemption amount remaining. And for a married couple, it's, you can actually double that amount. So I, I just I mentioned that so, because there's quite often a lot of misunderstanding about how this uh, annual exclusion works. A lot of people think that it only applies to family members. And that's not true, but that is an annual amount. So you can, you can make gifts of $14,000 to somebody this year, and then you can, January 1st next year, you can make another gift of $14,000, and maybe next January the amount will have gone up some if we've had enough inflation. I want to point out also that, that when you're valuing the total value of your state for estate tax purposes, you have to include in that number the death benefit of all the life insurance that you own. I want to make sure I'm clear on that. All of the death benefit of life insurance that you own is included in that calculation. Now I have to underscore this because a lot of people had the impression or belief that life insurance didn't count because the life insurance agent they bought it from told them that, that the death benefit was tax-free. Now actually the death benefit is income tax-free. Whoever receives that death benefit, they don't have to pay income tax on that. It is totally income tax-free, but that value counts as money that was belonging to you that you passed 
So whatever the death benefit is, that has to be added to the total value of all of your other assets. And a lot of people overlook that. And sometimes we have clients who have estate tax liabilities solely because they have life insurance that we didn't get out of their estate before they died. I want to talk about basis step up for a minute because I think that's really the new and much bigger issue for almost all the families that we do planning work for. And, and so let me do a little bit of education here on how that works. Basis is, uh, is an accounting term that means what I paid for something. So if I, if I have a farm I bought and I paid uh, $1,000 an acre for that farm, that $1,000 an acre is my basis. Now, I'm, I don't want to complicate this. I know that if you've, if you've <clears throat> drilled wells on the property, if you've done land leveling, you've improved the land, you know, you've, you've added to your basis. But let's just keep this discussion simple and just imagine that you have land that years ago you paid $1,000 an acre for. If that, if, if, if that property today could sell for, let's say, $5,000 an acre if you want to sell it, that means that, that if, if you, as the owner of that land, uh, sold that, that, that acre of land, there would be $4,000 of capital gain to be paid. Because if you sold it for five and your basis is one, the difference is the gain. And because you held it, more than a year, presumably, um, the, that's long-term gain is taxed at long-term capital gains rates, and the federal rate on that is 20 percent. The Arkansas rate is 4.9 percent, and the Obamacare tax on that is 3.8 percent. So there's a lot more capital gains tax going on now than there was a couple years ago, because one of the things that happened that that actually improved the estate tax from the point of view of most of our clients actually turned out to be quite detrimental when it came to you know this capital gains issue so if if i have property that has appreciated and that's true whether it's uh, walmart stock or stock in any publicly traded company or any closely held business whether it's real estate anything i have that has appreciated in value if i sell it it's going to trigger this capital gains tax However, if I own that asset on the day I die so that that asset is passed on to my heirs as a result of my death, that asset gets what's called a step-up in basis. So that farm, for example, that I paid $1,000 an acre for, if I owned that farm the day I die and it was worth $5,000 an acre on the date of my death, then the cost basis in that farm in the hands of my heirs is not $1,000 anymore. It's $5,000, which means that when they go to sell it, if they ever do, at some point in the future, we're going to look back to that $5,000 number as the benchmark for calculating the capital gains tax. So if they keep it for a long time and sell it for $7,000 an acre, they're going to have a $2,000 per acre capital gain in that, but the first $5,000 escaped the capital gains tax entirely because it passed from me to them as a result of my death. Now, in order for this basis step up to, to happen, the asset has to be included in your estate for estate tax purposes, but that doesn't mean you have to pay estate tax on it. It just means that you had to own it when you die. It may well be that if your estate is under the $5 million number that we talked about, or if it's a married couple and you're under $10 million, then those assets will be includable in the calculation of your estate so that it's estate tax countable, but there's still no estate tax due, but your heirs still get the basis step up. So I, I want to take a little time to talk through that because, in my opinion, this is an issue that affects probably for every one client I have that's impacted by the estate tax, there probably are 30 or 40 clients that are impacted by this basis step-up issue. And there are a number of ways that you can mess this up. And I want to talk about this so that your knowledge will not let that happen. So let me just say that if, 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 you're, if, if your estate is under $5 million, or that $5.43 million this year, or if you're a married couple and your estate, your combined estate is under the 
or $10.86 million, um, then there's a different way of thinking about how we would plan for you than the way we would have done it two or three years ago. So several points I want to make. Number one, you should consider simplifying your estate plan if you did one of those A-B plans like I talked about. And a lot of people have done those. This has been the way it was done for decades. The, you know, in order to avoid losing the exemption, everybody went in and did an A-B will or an A-B living trust that required that at the first death, the assets had to be divided into those A-B trust. Now we don't have to do that anymore. And actually, now... There are some problems with doing that that actually make it costly if we do that. So what we're recommending to all of our clients is that they come in and simpl or come to see us or come to see whoever it is that did the estate plan and simplify the plan so that we eliminate that A-B planning or we modify the A-B planning to, to eliminate the downside, which is the downside of the A-B planning, which is this. And, and so think with me, if, if I create an A-B plan and, and my ass, if I'm, the, if I'm the spouse that dies and my portion of what we have passes into that B trust, those assets actually do get a step up in basis at my death because they were included in my estate and they, they pass in this B trust. But let's suppose that, that my wife lives on for another 5 or 10 or 20 years and let's suppose that the assets that we have continue appreciating. That means that the assets in my B trust continue to appreciate. Well, when my wife dies later, the assets in that B trust are not includable in her estate for estate tax purposes. Remember, that's why we set up that B trust in the first place, is so those assets wouldn't be includable in her estate. That's how we got to use that exemption. But what also happens is because the assets are not included in her estate, they also don't get a second basis step up. It may be that the assets in that B trust are worth two or three times at my wife's death what they were worth when I died. And, and, and so there is no second step up in basis as a result of my wife's passing. And what that means is that it, when my wife dies, it may well be that the combined value of everything we have is still less than that 11 million or so dollars that, that could pass tax-free to our children, but the assets in the B Trust didn't get a basis step up, and that means that when our children inherit those assets, there's going to be a substantial, potentially a substantial capital gains tax to be paid as a result of the structure, the way we created our estate plan back before this law change happened. So simplifying your estate plan uh, not only reduces the hassle of having to divide everything into two separate trusts at the first death, it also protects what we call the double step up in basis. Um, let me just mention also that there's been a very recent law change in the state of Tennessee that allows us to do something very unusual. Actually, uh, only two states allow this, and uh, and and I'll take a minute to explain the problem. We, we live here in Arkansas in what we call a common law state. The, you, you've all heard of community property, I'm sure. You know that if you live in Texas or California or a number of other states, if you're married and acquire property, it's called community property. But you know the law as it relates to this basis step-up business is quite different in community property states than it is in these common law states like Arkansas. In a common law state, if my wife and I own property, when I die, my portion of the property gets a basis step up at my death to its fair market value. But my wife's property doesn't. That property doesn't get a basis step up until she dies. However, if my wife and I lived in Texas or in California or any one of the other community property states, and if that property were treated under the law of that state as community property, when the first one of us died, doesn't matter who, the entire value of the property gets a basis step up. The whole thing, not just half of it. That's a pretty big deal. And so what uh, one state did a number of years ago, it was a community property state, and what they said is, we're going to create a way that people who live in common law states, like Arkansas, can create 
a fairly simple trust and transfer their marital property into that trust and elect to have that property treated as community property so that when the first spouse dies, there's a basis step up on the whole thing, not just half of it. The state that passed the law that allowed for that was Alaska. That was about 15 years ago they did that and allowed for the creation of, an, of what we call an Alaska Community Property Trust. Just a couple years ago, Tennessee cloned that legislation so that it's now possible to, for a married couple to create a Tennessee Community Property Trust, transfer their appreciated marital property into that trust, and then when the first spouse dies, get a complete step up in basis on all of it. And, and I, I really like this strategy because it allows us to, to, to get that full, complete step up in basis on, on all the property and not have to guess in, adv you know, in advance who's going to pass first. You know, I've never been very good at guessing those things. You know, I mean, if we knew for sure that the husband was going to be the guy to die first, we could just transfer the ownership of everything into his name so that it would all be his when he died. But, you know, um, we can't ever be sure that nature is going to play out like that. So this community property trust allows us to get really the best of both worlds, to get that 100% step up in basis without having to guess who, who's going to pass first. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. This, is, this would really be the subject of another, another workshop entirely. But if you have an estate that is really large enough that, that, it's, that you're over the exemption, that is, if you're if you're a single person and you've got more than the 5.43 million or you're a married couple and you've got twice that amount, I just want to say that, that there are some j rather amazing and powerful solutions that are available to us now that are actually more powerful, have more potential to avoid the estate tax than at any time in history. Um, and we implement those solutions all the time for our clients who, whose estates are large enough that there would otherwise be a state tax. One of the things that we do is we take the insurance, the life insurance that the client owns, and, and m remove that from the estate by transferring that insurance into a life insurance trust. That's one of the tools. Sometimes we also suggest to clients that we buy life insurance as a backup to make sure that, that we always have the liquidity in case we need it. But the other objective that we want to accomplish is we, we want to be able to, to put a plan in place that freezes the value of the assets that you have at their current values. Because over time, assets, and particularly uh, farm land assets, have, have had a tendency to increase in value. And there are some strategies that we have available that allow us to, to freeze those values at their current levels so that... Um, that in the years to come, if that land is worth two or three times as much as it is today, we've locked that value in at 2015 values. Okay, um, one of the issues that farm families have to deal with, and this is, this is an issue that families who don't have a farm really don't have to worry about. It's figuring out who gets the farm. Invariably, in the farm families that we do work for, we have a we have families that have several children, and not all of them want to be a part of the farming operation. I'm a really good example of that myself. I grew up in a family, a farm family, and I was the family member that wanted to go to law school and practice law, and my brother was the, was, was the family member who wanted to be the farmer. And so for the family where, where the farmland, which has sometimes been in the family for generations, the issue that you have to deal with is how can we treat the people that we love equally and care about equally? How do we treat them fairly? And that is a really difficult challenge because quite often, in my experience, the farm families I've done work for, uh, when they're old enough to really be thinking seriously about these issues, they've been farming with a son or daughter for 10 or 15 or 20 years and that son or daughter has been there for them, has been involved in the farming operation, has felt and acted like a partner in the farming operation. That son or daughter has really given uh, the senior generation farm family members the freedom to travel, the freedom to go out and see the country and see the world in ways they never would have been able to do but for the involvement of that farm family member. 
And so when I sit down with these families, what they tell me is that, is that dividing everything that we have equally between all of our children, the ones that participated in the, in the farming operation and the ones that decided to become doctors or lawyers or go off and do other things, dividing those things equally is not necessarily the fair thing to do. So we have to spend a lot of time with our farm families figuring out how to be, how to be fair. So who gets the farm? There are a lot of ways to do this, and there's no cookie-cutter solution to it. But I'll tell you that one of the things that we do is that we will quite often find a way to leave the farm land uh, to, the, to, the, to the child who has stayed on the farm and farmed with the parents. Uh, we'll leave it to that child and allocate a, a, a discounted value to it. I've called it here in my slide a sweetheart value. So we've said, for example, we know today our farm may be worth, you know, $5,000 an acre, but what we're going to do is we're going to allocate the farm so that our son who stayed with us and farmed, he gets the farm, but it gets valued at, at, at a lesser number than the $5,000 an acre. We might allocate it to him at, you know, $2,500 an acre or $3,000 an acre. But include in that arrangement a provision that if he sells the farm within, you know, some number of years after he inherits it from us, uh, if he goes out and sells it to some third party, we're not going to let him benefit from that sale. Our reason for letting him have the farm at a discount is to make it possible for him to keep farming. If he chooses not to do that, then we're going to recapture that benefit and spread that benefit out among all the family members. Uh, what we'll do sometimes is, is uh, our clients will actually go uh, if they don't have enough cash or securities, and usually they don't, uh, we'll go buy uh, life insurance. So we'll figure out what's what's the right amount that we want, what what's the fair value of the farm, and then figure out what the right amount is to, to make up for that to the other children and buy enough life insurance to fund that. Of course, we can only do that if our clients are young enough and healthy enough and have the cash flow to be able to afford the life insurance. We spend a lot of time talking about this issue. As I said, there's really no... There's no cookie cutter way to do it. Every time we've done it, we've had to just sit down and try out some different scenarios and then fine tune them to make it work. Every farm family that I work with, uh, I at least give the opportunity to hear about uh, what I call the King Ranch story. Because I think this is, this is compelling. And for a lot of our clients, it really does offer uh, an interesting solution to this problem. You know, back in the old days, Back in the old days in, in Texas and a lot of other places, when, when a rancher would die with a large ranch, the way that rancher would pass that ranch on to family members is make a will to say, when I die, just divide my ranch up among all of my children. And, and if you think about it, after two or three generations of doing that, what might have started out as a really big ranch turns out to be uh, you know, a whole bunch of little ranchettes, if you will. And so uh, that's typically how people did it. That's how people did it in Texas. That's how people did it in Arkansas and just about everywhere. But in 1914, the Kleberg family that owned the King Ranch decided to do something different. Now, the way they chose to do it would not be exactly the way we would do it today. We actually have better legal tools than they had in 1914 to do this. But what they did is they formed a corporation. And they took all of the, the ranch land and the ranching operation and put all of that into the King Ranch Corporation. So that when they passed, there was no division of the land at all. What happened was a division of the stock in the King Ranch Corporation among their heirs. And it's continued that way down through the generations. And now, as of this year, we're in the 101st year uh, of time since they did that. And, and I don't know exactly the number of, uh, of King Ranch heirs. I, I'd heard a few years ago that there were about 250 shareholders in the King Ranch Corporation, but there's still just one ranch. And because they kept the ranch together, they were able to uh, it was large enough, they were able to go out and, and attract the, 
best and most talented people to help them run it. They were able to open a store. They, they have King Ranch uh, gear. You can buy your King Ranch t-shirt and you can buy your King Ranch cap. They licensed the brand to Ford Motor Company to put on the on, on pickup trucks. Uh, they've, they had the resources to create a special breed of Santa Gertrudis cattle that they've, that they've grown there. The point is that, that by, by keeping the ranch together as one unified enterprise, they were able to do things that they would not, that nobody, that none of the heirs would have been able to do had they divided the ranch up. And so we've learned um, by not just seeing how the Kleberg family did it and how well that worked, but just by watching uh, a lot of our clients over the years, we've developed uh, a little, uh, little insight or an observation, a little bit of wisdom, if you will, about what happens when people pass property. And so let me share it with you. And this is, uh, this is a phrase that I've worked on, and, and this is, you know, I, I want to think at least this, this is original with me, although I'm sure many other people have reached the same observation, the same conclusion. And that is this, that wealth that is aggregated and managed grows. Wealth that is divided and distributed inevitably dissipates. Wealth that's aggregated and managed grows. Wealth that is divided and distributed dissipates. That is a truth that I have observed that, that, that is consistently true in my 30 years of experience as an estate planning attorney. So what we encourage clients to do is to create two entities. One is an entity that owns the farm operations and usually the equipment, the tractors, the combines, and the pivots, and all of that. And then have another entity that owns the farm land. And so what happens then is whenever the farm family passes, they make one provision, one arrangement to leave the farming operation to that member of the family that's active in the farming operation, but then the land actually is not divided. Um, I mean, the, the entity that owns the land is divided among all the family members, among the, the family member that's active in farming and the family members that decide to become doctors and move to Memphis and all, you know, all, all the other family members. And then the family member that uh, is active in the farming operation is usually accorded some preferential right to lease the land from that entity as long as that family member wants to be active in the farming operation and sometimes at, 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 uh, a, on a rental basis that's, that's comparatively attractive to what the market rate would be. And in that way, we're able to balance the interest of the family member that, that has a desire to stay in and be active in the farming operation and to balance, balance those interests against the interests of the other family members who've decided to pursue their lives in different ways. So that's a solution that, that, is, that is really sometimes really attractive for a lot of our family members. And what that allows us to do is to know that we're, gonna, we're creating a, an arrangement that allows the farm land, which we may, it, may have, it may have taken three or four generations to put this farm together uh, it allows us to keep it together so we don't have to start dividing it up and have, having it be dissipated. We can know with some confidence that 50 or 100 years from now, this farm that we've spent our life and maybe our parents spent their lives uh, assembling is going to still be there and it's going to still be benefiting, still going to be feeding our other family members, whether they're active in the farming operation or whether they've decided to pursue entirely different careers. All right. Step number five, protect the farm from the cost of nursing home care. In Arkansas, in 2015, it cost five to $6,000 a month to be in a nursing home. And if, it, if a couple goes in a nursing home, you can double that. I want to point out also that there is a 70% chance that, that, we're going to be, that we're going to spend some time in a nursing home before we die. And we're going to pay for it out of pocket unless we are broke. And the way the state Medicaid program defines broke is to say that when the value of all the assets that we have have been reduced down to $2,000, then we'll qualify to have the state of Arkansas Medicaid program pay for our cost of nursing home care. 
I believe that the cost of long-term care poses the greatest risk to most of our farm family clients, the greatest risk to losing the family farm. I want to say that there are really good solutions that are available, but all the solutions really only work if you plan early. If you wait too long, the solutions don't work nearly as well. Let me tell you what not to do. Do not give assets to children. I don't care how much you trust them. Don't transfer the title of assets to children. The reason I say that is because this whole capital gains discussion that we were having earlier, if you give an asset to a child and that child later sells the asset, their cost basis in that asset is what that, that asset was worth in your hands. You know, your death doesn't, doesn't cause that asset to, the basis of that asset to go up. Uh, if you give an asset away, you're also giving the capital gains tax associated with it away. In order to get the basis step up, you have to still own that asset when you die unless you set up a special kind of trust I'm going to talk about. The other reason I encourage you not to give assets to children is that they can lose those assets in a divorce, they can lose it in a lawsuit, they can lose it because they're immature. But even if they're not immature, they can still get sued and lose it. And it may be that, that you really needed the availability of that asset to pay for your, your nursing home care because if you give it away, if you give those assets away and then go into nursing home within a five-year period, you're disqualified from uh, receiving the Medicaid benefit. Better way to do this, I believe, is to set up a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. And I think this Medicaid Asset Protection Trust solves a lot of the problems I've been talking about. It's not, this is not a living trust. I want to be very clear that a, a basic living trust estate plan does not start that five-year clock ticking on, on transfers that will qualify you later for the Medicaid program. It's a, this is a different kind of trust. That's why we call it a Medicaid Asset protect, Protection Trust. But if you transfer assets to the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, when you die, those assets still receive a, a basis step up at your death. So your children inherit those assets at a new cost basis, which is equal to what those assets were worth on the day that you died. The other benefit, the, the other benefit uh, in, this, in this arrangement is that you get to retain the power to decide who inherits those assets when you die. If you give the assets away now, you've totally lost control over them. If you transfer the assets to a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, you get to retain the right to change your mind about who gets them. Also, inside this Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, these assets are insulated from your children's divorce, insulated from children's lawsuits or judgments, so you don't have the risk of having the assets lost to any of those reasons. Also think that it's a good idea to look at long-term care insurance or look at, uh, there's some, na some new life insurance products out there now that, that have long-term care riders. And what that allows you to do is to, is to do some mathematical calculations to make certain that if you make the transfer to get the five-year clock ticking, and then end up having to go in a nursing home during that five-year period, you can tap into that long-term care insurance or the long-term care rider on that life insurance policy and know that you, that you have that first five years of nursing home care paid for. So a combination of a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust and long-term care insurance or life insurance with a long-term care rider, in our view, is the better way to protect the family farm from being lost to the cost of long-term care. Uh, I've created a little model here that shows how this works, and uh, you'll see that in my example, we have, a, we have a, an estate plan where there is a living trust and an irrevocable trust. That's the, the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. What's happening here is you'll see is that our, our client is creating this Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, naming the children to be the co-trustees, naming the children as beneficiaries, and under the terms of this trust, our clients transfer the assets, but they give up any, any right to the principal. That's one of the downsides to the arrangements. You do give up the right to principal. You do need to believe in making this arrangement that your children will, will share the assets with you if, you if you need them. That's why you only want to choose as trustees 
the children that you really trust. What you do retain, however, as the trust maker is the right to all the income from the trust and, importantly, you retain the right to change who the beneficiaries of the trust are. So if the children uh, are not cooperative, you do have, a, you do have some power to uh, take that into account in exercising your right to change the beneficiaries. You, the assets are transferred in, and the day you do that starts the five-year clock ticking on that transfer. So five years and one day after that transfer, if you end up in a nursing home and the assets that you have outside this trust are worth less than $2,000, then you'll be Medicaid qualified, and the state Medicaid program will pay for the cost of your long-term care at that point. During your lifetime, the income from the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust is paid back to you so you have that to spend, and if you go into nursing home, of course, that money is going to be used to pay for, or to apply against the cost of nursing home care. So sometimes we design these trusts so that that right to income gets toggled off. But clients often ask us, well, what happens if I make this transfer to this trust and I end up in a nursing home, or for some other reason I need the assets that are in this trust and the five-year clock hasn't run yet. Well, the way that works is this. I told you we named children that we trusted to serve as trustees. What happens is they make distributions from the trust to themselves, which they're permitted to do, and then without any legal duty to give us the money back, we believe our children then will choose to exercise their right to make a gift back to us of the money that we need. That's how the arrangement works. And then when we die, the whole plan comes together again, as you can see, and the assets are divided among all of our children. And in this instance, you see we have the assets going into testamentary trust where the assets continue to be protected from divorce and lawsuits for the benefit of those children. So let me just suggest finally that, that uh, there are a number of reasons you should, if you haven't done this recently, there are a number of reasons to review your estate plan. Number one, if you have a living trust-based estate plan, you need to make sure the trust is properly funded so that you avoid probate. And that's where we confirm that all of the assets you have are properly titled in your living trust. When we talk to clients that haven't been to see us in a while, one of the things we notice is that they have some assets that are out there that are not in the trust. And we have to catch those and put them in, or those assets will have to go through the probate court. By reviewing your plan, you also may want to make some changes that, uh, that will get us to zero estate tax. And there's, as I said, there are a lot of great things that we can do to freeze values and even eliminate the value. I believe that today it's possible with the tools that we have at our disposal here to eliminate the estate tax on estates that are 30 or $40 million and sometimes even more. Reviewing your estate plan right now also gives you the opportunity to either completely strip out those AB provisions that are in there or to modify them in a way so that we get the benefit of that second step up in basis when the surviving spouse passes and also to consider adding provisions to our plan that provide divorce, lawsuit, and maturity protection for heirs. Uh, and I say that because a lot of the plans we look, that we review, uh, that was not a topic of conversation. And so the, uh, the, those kind of features have typically not been included in most of the plans that we've looked at. Uh, it also gives you the opportunity to look at the need for nursing home protection planning and finally the opportunity to review old life insurance policies. One of the things that we've learned is that the insurance industry has, has um, taken another look at the actuarials. So uh, they've, the insurance industry has concluded that all of us are going to live longer than they thought we were back years ago when they originally sold us these life insurance policies. And as a result of that now, uh, it's possible to actually rework those policies and for no additional money actually obtain a significantly larger death benefit than you have under the current policies. What I'm talking about is if you have an old insurance policy that hasn't been looked at in a good long time, 
there's a real opportunity here to take the same money you're spending on it and, and substantially increase the death benefit. Or sometimes what we've been able to do is to take that old insurance policy and rework it so that you kept the same ben death benefit that you have, but you reduced or even eliminated the obligation to continue paying premium payments. So, so those policies, if you have an insurance policy that, that you've purchased more than six or seven years ago, in our opinion, it's worth, it's worth reviewing that policy just to see if we can do better with it. Anyway, those are some ideas that I believe, if, if you thoughtfully consider, these are ways that you, that you can make certain that you